when you got to South Africa after the after Zimbabwe, you were then due to go to right. To, to and fire, I right? did a, I did a, I, I you, you got some tests you take, and yeah. I made some I made some witty comments on this one test, you know. And I'm I'm not going to go into it, but I really I thought I was chuckling to myself under my breath. I mean, I couldn't stand it, and uh, and it, it, and I guess they didn't like it. So I I had to speak with General Lutz. And Colonel Bradenbach later told me, "What a, he's what a loser. He shouldn't even been there. He's never been operational, you know. And uh, so, how he ever got the post, you know, you know uh, I'll never know. Probably a brooder butter. That's all I could think. And um, anyway, uh, so um, I uh, and I'm sitting down and talking with him, and you know, toward the end of the interview, and I, I could tell I just didn't like the didn't like his his his, way, his manner." And uh, he says, what's, what's this flag above me here on the top of my uh, hutch? I said, well, it's the, it's a Degla Mishterag rule, okay? And, uh, and, and, I, and I, says, I says, it's the flag of the border police. And I said, they're Drusim, they're not Jews. They're Drus, they're a very martial tribe, Arabic tribe. And they've always been on sides with the Jews, right through independence. At, you know, they, they, they wounded Haganah, they would take them in and nurse them. They were and they were real fighters. They're very martial, very martial, and, um, uh, and you know. So uh, yeah, and he says, and he says, I think you're a, Mo a Mossad agent and maybe a, a mercenary and a drifter. He says, you know, he says, you want to go in the army? That's fine. Go see Colonel Braidenbach. And I had to do another selection. And of course, Peter McAleese was running the selection, and only three of us passed that. You know, it was an SAS selection. We yeah. we, we we were you know I'd been in the army a week. You know, I was still half hung over and from the the New Year holiday and, and then we, we go we go right up to the Drakensberg, right up the top of the Drakensberg, and we were up there for seven days. And it just rained and rained and rained. But I you know, I got through it myself and two others mm -hmm. and uh, out of seventeen. And um, you know and I was on, I was in the Pathfinders. And it's you know, it's funny how God works. You know, I I've gotta tell you this, Jeff. I mean now I ended up in Colonel Bradenbach, and I mean I I fit in well with the guys, you know, and uh, um, to the fact that we we operated well together, you know, I did the selection, and uh, but I I I like being around South Africans. I was in South. I wanted to know about you people. I was thinking of making my life here, yeah. you know, which I did for many years, and um, uh, and I I appreciated it. There was a there was the Rhodesians were had something that were really unique. Right, and I'm just so happy to have a little part of that. But now I'm in South Africa. This is going to be a longer term thing. But I, I saw the South Africans as very stalwart, very, very determined in what they do. You know, and, and as pretty straightforward as people, um, just on general, you know, uh, uh, observations. And uh, you know, people I could identify with. You know, mm. we're all veterans. You know, different wars, but we're all veterans. And um, anyway. I, um, I, you know, so I got along quite well, but I, I would be out when we got to on Dongwa, I'd be out looking around for stuff. And, you know, uh, you know, if the Colonel needed something, <clears throat> I'd go and find it. And, um, you know, I fired at 50 with the original system on there and between the driver and it blew the Colonel and, and Lang out of, the, out of the vehicle. It was really brutal. I'm surprised to have eardrums left. And um, so they, they said, and Colonel said to me, when we got back to the base, he got back to Dongwa, he says, Corporal Barr, we have to do something about that firing system. I said, I agree with you, sir. He says, so take care of it. And um, and I went over to the Air Force side, their armory, and I said, you got any mounts for 50s? And, uh, you know, because the mount they had on the thing was, was chicken shit, you know, from CSIR. And, um, and it had this big bodacious plate in front of it, you know, which really limited a lot of things. Yeah. And um, anyway... They said, "Yeah, yeah, we got it. We we've got it. it. Just hadn't been used forever. It's, we've got a twin fifty mount for, you know, for our aircraft." And I said, "Wow." I said, "Well, can I? I yeah, take it." So I I went over to the Air Force Ranger, Radar Squadron with Major Lopes was the commanding officer there, and him and I became very good friends. And um, he, um, uh, you know, and I I said to him, I. I Introduce myself, and I says, I'm, I'm Colonel Bradenbach's gunner, and he wants a different firing system. I got this twin 50 mount. He, he says, okay, let me get my my uh, uh, RSM from the workshop head, or top sergeant, whoever run the workshop. And um, <clears throat> and the guy came over and explained, he says, yeah, we can do that. They shut that workshop down 
and worked five days. That's all he worked on was this vehicle and set this mount up. And then I, and I knew, I'm probably the only guy in the SADF knew how to change a 50 from left-hand feed to right-hand right feed. feed yeah. you know, and uh, um, which I did. And we mounted these guns in there and loaded the cans. I got a 14.5 sight for it, which had electric, you flick it on with some zing, you know, at night, you had night vision with it. I'm not night vision as such, but you could, you could things were patterned off where you could yeah. put something in the sight and go for it, you know, and really easy at night. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, and this thing was on, and after five days we fired it, you know, and um, on, on the other side of the base. And I went back over and I just happened to catch Colonel Breidenbach when we come in, uh, you know, uh, at, to the Sergeant Major's tent and uh, to say, look what we got here, Sergeant Major. Nobody had seen it except me. Before we, and, and I called, I then got a hold of Lang and he'd come over and got the vehicle and we drove it over. And they'd heard it firing all the way across the base. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he says, was that, was that you? I said, that was me. I, he says, is this? He said, yes, this, sir. I said, it's beautiful. It would balance on, on a single point yeah. like that. So you had so, it was so easy to control. And, um, and, and he says, wow. He says, I said, yes, sir. You just heard the voice of America. <laughs> and that's what it stuck. That's what he called the vehicle. You know, right? And um, um, anyway, and, and it was a really an effective weapon. You know, and it would, we had, so at a certain, a certain range, the rounds would, would cross as they should with any twins. And um, um, or even quadruples, yeah. and uh, um, so it was. You know, it was a great piece of equipment. Um, unfortunately, it perished to the mine. Yeah. And um, anyway, um, so you know, we we would we did foot operations. We did you know vehicle operations, both. And uh, you know we um, and we were on Operation Protea. Yeah. And um, when you know it was, it was three thirty in the afternoon, I could I just. I saw it very clear in my mind, and um, and I said to Graham, I says, I says, Graham, something's going to come down. Something's coming down. Stand by. And my hair was up on the back of my neck, and I just turned back and grabbed the firing handles when the left rear wheel initiated what we figured was a TM57. It's an anti-tank mine. You know, it's 32 pounds or uh, uh, 16 kgs of uh, of TNT. Yeah. It's a shaped charge. <clears throat> And man, that mine went off. The last I ever heard, he left here was just pop. And I, the vehicle was just, I was being propelled up, just yeah. being launched. And um, I thought, well, that's it. We've hit a mine. I'm dead. And I'm going to stand in front of God here just now answering for my life. And uh, God had other pro other, other, uh, other um, ideas. And all of a sudden, that whole thing went up on fire. We had six. We just rearmed. That morning, so we had six jerry cans full of gasoline, you know, mm. uh, petrol, and they boom, and I think the heat of hell itself rose up at me, and I fell right back in the spot that I had been launched from. But my legs were all twisted around it. I'm making some feeble effort to get out. You know, I was on fire. Yeah. I mean, I'm on fire everywhere, and um, um, and and all of a sudden, a set of hands, just, I, and I couldn't see who they belonged to. It was in the flames, in those flames with me, and pulled me over the side. And and by that time, Lang, the driver, had come around, and he helped. And I'll never forget his glasses hanging off the bottom mm -hmm. of his face. And he helped pull, the colonel pulled me away, and they had to get moving and because we had C4 on board. He was going to hit a critical heat, and when it did, boom, which is what happened. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, you know, and, and Colonel, that was his third landmine. The third time he'd been blown out of a vehicle from a landmine. What a guy. And I, you know, and, and I spoke to him on the 40th anniversary of that mine. I was in Missouri mm -hmm. getting ready to run a, 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 an event for a, a charity I do called yeah. the Patriot Express, you know, for benefit veterans' families. And um, uh, when they get a loved one back from the war, yeah. men mentally, physically, or both. And... Um, you know, and the colonel said, oh, I, God just told me, go, go, go get him. I, I couldn't see you. It was just fire. Mm. Go. And I, he says, I heard the very him say, go. And I went. And I says, I don't know how I found you. And, and got you and pulled you over the side. And, <laughs> uh, and he wasn't burnt. His, his uniform was blackened, and he was blackened, but he wasn't burnt. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the hand of God was on him. And um, anyway, him and Lang pulled me away, and, and the vehicle went up. Um, and, um, you know, so 
we started a very long journey um, back from there, you know, to, I knew my, I, I could look at it, I knew my right leg was going to go. Yeah. And uh, they kind of straightened me out, and my, my tibia fibia were broken on the left side, mm. and they you know, straightened everything out as best they could. They can give me some sauce again, you know, and, um, you know, I was loose and never went into shock. And um, and the colonel, this is something I only found out about 10 years ago. <clears throat> the colonel was calling in to, to headquarters and, and saying, hey, we got a, we got a hard, we got a hard medevac. And, and Graham Radoman had been blown out and his ankle was crushed. And um, he was sitting on the back with one leg on jerry cans and one foot down in the back of the, the vehicle. And that was the foot that got right foot, got uh, uh, crushed the uh, ankle, and um, I said we got a we got a hard you know this guy we need to get him out of here. And I said sorry, let him expire. We're not coming. We're not sending any assets. And he kept pecking away. Well, apparently an Alouette gunship, a set of them, the gunship operating two, heard it, overheard it. And he says, Hey, I'm I'm getting down to low fuel. I'm going to have a light anytime. I says have that guy ready. Give me your cordons. Have it ready. I have no spare time. And he came, he came in, I'll never forget. They took me over the vehicle and they folded me up. My right knee is crushed. The ankles are crushed. You know, and the, 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 the tibia and fibula are broken. Yeah. And I will never forget that. And they stuck me into the helicopter uh, on, on, and uh, by the 20 mil. And, uh, uh, and off he went and Graham on the other helicopter. And, um, you know, and I've never, I, I never forget. It's funny how your mind works. You know, 11 years earlier in August, yeah. I was on flying medevacs, you know, as a 50 cal gunner. And we're myself and the crew chief and the other guy, we'd be constantly going, come on, guy, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. And there we were. I was on the floor. They're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. come on, guy, keep it, stay, you know, stay with us. And um, anyway, I, you know, I never worried about dying. Funny, I just, that was, mm -hmm. it didn't, didn't cross my mind. And, uh, I, but I knew I was in, I was going to have a long, hard row back. And I, I said to Lang there at the, at the time, before the helicopters came, it was about two to three hours, I reckon. And, uh, you know, um, and I said, Lang, this, this leg's going to go. And he didn't want to talk about it. Anyway, so on the helicopter, down to a, for, a forward first aid, aid station where they were able to get me an air splint. And all my clothes were just burned. I mean, what yeah. was left, and you know, um, which probably was good because it probably it killed. It, it obviously staunched arterial bleeding. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, dirty, filthy wounds. You bet, I'm going to have septicemia, and that's why you go to Ward Two in one mill. And we went to a then about eleven eleven at night. We were flown on a Puma down to uh, on Ashikadi yeah. to the forward field hospital. And, um, and and there I, I'll never forget. It was a Jewish doctor. I can tell you his name was very Stein something or other. And I says, Ah, you Houdi. And I says, Smith a bear. You know, I spoke to him in Hebrew, and he says, You speak. And I says, D and I says, can you know? And, and we had a conversation in Hebrew. Or even or not, it's funny. Yeah. You know, it, it's 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 like what, what happens. You wear your mind how it works, and um, under extreme duress. And uh, he, you know, I says, he says, Well, he says, Listen. Guy, he says, yeah, maybe your days a soldier over. I says, we'll see about that, doctor. I says, now let's get on with it. And um, I woke up in two casts, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, one all the way up to my hip. And um, yeah, this other one was up to my hip as well on both sides. And uh, yeah, so, and then it was three days. And I'll never forget, Graham was never came out of it. And when he would start to stir, I could tell he was in pain. I'd, I'd get, hey, come on, give me a pain shot. I'd call the nurse. She'd come over and give me, give me a pain shot. I kind of looked after him all the way to one mill. And when we were put on a C-130, it was loaded with stretchers and flown down to one military hospital yeah. in Pretoria, where I was going to reside for the next nine and a half months. And um, in that time, I, I, well, count number one operation there at, at Ashikadi, I went, underwent another 19 uh, yeah. operations four of which were amputations. You know, I elected to have everyone. You know, I, I said that, that foot, it's, it's on the right side. It, it stinks, it's no good, get rid of it. And my right knee was open, it was wide open. And they'd went in there and, and, and they, it was, it, gosh, it was full of crap. They'd, for every four hours, four hour, every four hours, 24 hours a day, they'd go in and irrigate it and scoop around in there. And I had to hold it for them. To get near me, they had to give me an intravenous shot of Valium. Or I'd have torn their heads off, 
you know, and, um, and you know, I can't even describe to you what that was. After two weeks, I said, I, I spoke to Commandant Odal. What a great man. He was the head orthopedic surgeon, and he's a guy that always worked on me. Yeah. And I says, I says, Commandant, I says, what, what are we going to have here when this is all done on his knee? He says, well, maybe, a, maybe 50 percent. I don't know. He says, I'm not sure. I said, okay. So let's take it off. I said, let's, let's take it off. Let's take our chance with a mechanical knee. He says, you sure? I says, yeah, let's go. So I brought the papers in, and I did the same thing with the foot. I said, get get rid of it. And you know, they cut below the knee. And then uh, with the knee, it was the same thing. After a couple of weeks, with it, I just said, do it. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And they cut it off. And actually, after an amputation, it felt better than, mm -hmm. than before it. I mean, it was still sore as hell, but it was better than before the amputation. And there was no more... No more coming at me every four hours with yeah. that, you know. And uh, anyway, now we're got a hole in the left foot. It was about like that in the ankle, and uh, you know they uh, they did some operations, and but they had it was full of septicemia, so they're also in there every six hours cleaning yeah. it up. And that went on for months, and I was actually walking, and the, the the tibia fibia healed, mm -hmm. and I cast for a long time, and uh, I think about six seven weeks, and uh, that healed and. Um, and I started walking in parallel bars. I can't, I could never describe the pain. I could never describe it to you. You know, I'd go back and forth, maybe three, four times. I was soaked with sweat, just soaked. Yeah. Like I'd been out in a rainstorm or in a shower, my clothes on. And, um, and then they tried a couple more operations. You know, the thing, same, same, same thing. And finally, I, you know, the commandant and I were sitting and he says, I don't know. He says, Dave, I, Maybe consider taking it off. He says, you know, I, he says, I fail. You'll struggle with this and win. But still, you're, you, know, you know, you know, when you wake up, it's gone. You never get it back. Yeah. So I had to think about it a little bit, you know, and uh, and I had tea. I, I would have tea at least once a week with the physios and Major Kemp sometime would drop in with tea. You know, and it's their chance to get away from the, their patients. But mm -hmm. they, they kind of accepted me as a little protege. You know, and I'd sit there and listen to them, and they're they're wonderful women, just wonderful, masochistic, but the really masochistic ones were the best looking ones. So <laughs> so, it wasn't so bad, you know, them working you over. And uh, anyway, um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I asked him, I says, you know, I I says Major Kemp was there. I says, what what am I going to have here when we, if this thing heals? You know, I says, oh, she says, you'll have a cosmetic leg. I said, cosmetic leg. Yeah, he's cosmetic leg. You have a leg. Ah, I says, well, I ride a motorcycle again with this leg. Well, I skydive again. How about going back to the Army? They looked at me as if I was mad, and that was my answer. I, I requested a, a Commandant Odendahl. I says, let's take this thing off. Let's get rid of it. it was a big decision. And, um, and a week before Christmas in 1981, you know, they, uh, they wheeled me in. They took the foot off. They let it bleed for two days to get all the septicemia out. Mm. And then they hit it again on Thursday, on just with four inches below the knee, standard cut. Yeah. And from then on, I was moving back. I was yeah. on my way back, yeah. And I, I had got the right prosthesis. I, I then got the left. And I, I got that wheelchair. It was a constant fight for it. We had three wheelchairs, sometimes for up to 40 men. You know, you had to fight for that bloody thing. You know, and it was a ward two. What a shithole. And that whole hospital... I had four sinks, one bathtub, and two toilets in there, and there was no apartheid in there. They had Ovambos in there and everything. I'd never seen a bathtub, you know, and we had to live together. And it was a horrid place, radios blaring away, and I hated it. And, and sometimes I'd, I'd go down to the bottom of the hospital. A very funny story. <laughs> I got sick down there once when drinking wine. I was by myself. I'd sleep down there, you know, and then wheel back early in the morning. And, and um, so I took the fire hose out and I turned it on <laughs> on the end of the wheelchair. I was flying around on the end of the fire hose. So I mean, if you had a home, home, home video of that, you would have been, would have been a winner. You know, I mean, I was running the wall with this thing. Finally, I got the valve shut off and I it just seeped a good a bit of water. You know, I, you, you could draw, but I just pulled it back. Whoa, you know, <laughs> it was on the end of the whip. Um, and uh, anyway, got cleaned up. I went up, and uh, it, it's an experience I'll never, never forget. Anyway, but they were pretty permissive to me. They let me drink, yeah. you know, and um, 
uh, you know, so I could cut the painkillers out, yeah. you know, because what I needed was four hours a night. Yeah. And the burns, I burned all over my back. My upper arm still has yeah. some of the keloid on it, both arms, hands. You can see the, everything working. All the meat, uh, the meat was exposed and burned. Yeah. Same in the back and my neck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, it was a it was a rough go. And I had to clean those once a day and get all the flamazine off. And, and man, it was like I'd be in on fire. It'd take a half an hour. And, uh, you know, I, but that's how the day would start. You know, and them cleaning cleaning that up because it didn't smell good either, and um, you know, but I needed four hours of sleep, and I would dope up at night. I'd drop for four hours, and just drop, and I finally to stop that. I says, Major Kemp, can I drink a, maybe a glass of wine, sir, at night? And he says, That's fine. That sounds good. I'll prescribe it. Well, I got somebody to give me a liter of glass. <laughs> and and uh, anyway, and and you know, I, I had great support. A lot yeah. of the guys would come, and they'd come regularly. And no, yeah. you know, a lot of the guys that didn't have any family, you yeah. know, in the country, they'd just come and, you know, they'd bring booze, you know, and they never came empty-handed, you know, or, I remember. And, and we'd, we'd, you know, there was ones that were really regular, and Nutelovitz, you know, um, you know uh, Lieutenant Nutelovitz, we was pretty regular, and, uh, um, and you know, and we, we'd have quite a time, and, and the, the ward... The, the ward matron was uh, uh, Oldavaca Fry, and uh, was Sister Oldavaca, and she later became Sister Fry. What a great military nurse, you know, what a great nurse. She was tough. She'd been spent years up in Oshikati, and you, know, you couldn't bullshit her with, for nothing. And, uh, you know, she was tough but fair, and, and she never said anything. One time, my buddies bought my... my uh, my uh, sea chest, uh, you know, uh, my footlocker, you know, down from, from uh, you know, Angola, from Ondagua. Osh- uh, and I, 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 I had my, uh, my, my Beretta automatic pistol in there, and I had M26 grenades. One day I was cleaning the pistol on the bed, and I see her coming out through the sheet over, and she lifted the sheet, and there's, there's pistol parts laying, laying there, and she just threw the sheet on the thing and walked off, never said anything. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, so little did she know about the M26s. That's a, that's a fragmentation grenade. And, um, you know, we, we, well, we kept stuff like that. You, yeah. you know, if you run, you know, you come back from an operation, you short a grenade, you, know, you got your own to stick it on your go. Um, there's nothing unsafe about it except in, I, was in, I was in a not a good place <laughs> anyway. And so, yeah, it was, it, it was, there was, it was a hard, hard place to be. Yeah. But um, it was... Uh, it was, it was, there was some real liberties there that, that, and Major Briggs, the hospital matron was also an incredible, incredible nurse. And, uh, you know, she was a hospital matron and you took notice when she was around. And I, I will never forget when I got my, like, I, I got, got my both prosthesis and I had a piss standing up. It was the first time in, in months. And I said, that's it. I, you know, I will, I'll look my fellow man in the eye as an equal from here on. You know, and nothing less. Yeah. So, and things progressed in the hospital, and eventually I skydived, and April yeah. went AWOL to go and skydive out at uh, Clark's store. Yeah. And uh, I had a pill strapped to my ass, made four jumps, and Don Hornsby was responsible for all that. He was the national safety officer, and he just said, I'll stake my recommendation on him. He'll do it. He said, well, we got no record of anybody with a double amputee jumping. You know, and I said, well, he'll do it. He'll do it. He said, Okay. He's up to you. And he was with me. You know, we, we, yeah. we did a, a two-man together. Patty Foxcroft would fly on the yeah. plane. I'm still friends with Patty. We still speak on the phone. He's in England. Yeah. Uh, and, um, um, yeah, we're, and it was, you know, and, and I went AWOL to go and do this. So when I got back, there was shit in the land. You know, and, uh, you know, the, the <clears throat> colonel run in the hospital, and Major Briggs was pissed off. You know, and she was not a pleasant person. I mean, she was upset. You know, and uh, but I just told her what I did. Well, they found you know how they found out about it was a, you know the, the nurses would let me you know they I could go out you know, sometimes, and I'd just disappear during the night. Well, they knew I figured I was down at the bottom of the hospital. Well, I wasn't. I was out. Period. And um, you know, so they uh, you know, the the sisters, you know, I, you know, I they saw it was a newspaper article on it. So on the, you know, I think it was on the front page or something like that. So they couldn't help but see it. You know, and then, then what, what's this? He was supposed to be in the war. Where was this guy? You know, anyway. So, but they were, in the end, they were actually good humored about it. Yeah. Because they saw me growing, coming back. Yeah. And in June, I got out of the hospital. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, uh, from there, I went right back. I, had, was a, I said, I'm not leaving the hospital, not leaving it for a night. I walk out of here. The, I came in here with two legs. I'm leaving with two legs. I right, was different. It was the legs were prosthetics. Very crude devices, dating the talk now, technology dating to the 30s. Yeah. And, um, and that's it. There was a vehicle waiting, take me to the parachute brigade. I saw Sergeant Major McAleese, and he says, you want to be in the training team with us? I says, yes, sir, if you'll let me. He says, right, you're on. And uh, uh, and from uh, that was Friday, Terry Tagney and Chris Rogers and I got whopping drunk. And then Monday morning, we went to work. I was training machine gunnery, uh, the young paratroopers. Yeah. And then house warfare with them. Because, yeah, as you know, a machine gun doesn't sit outside. It's gonna, If it's in the squad, it's going in. Yeah. And it, it, that gunner, it's, he's got a lot more firepower than, than a 5.56 five, round. And he can really screw things up if he doesn't know what he's doing. And that's what I'd, I'd, I'd tell him. I'd show him how to do all that stuff. Yeah. You know, and keep him forward, fire, moving, a lot of things. You know, run, drop, and fire, you know, with a, with an MAG. And they're good lads, you know, they're tough yeah. lads. And uh, 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 that's what I always liked about you know, the, you know, the Parabats. And the, and the junior Pathfinders are even another level up. I, yeah. can, I really have nothing but good things to say about them. And... Um, and we then worked with a training, uh, a reserve, a reservist company, I think, was, and Captain Euster was a, the uh, uh, company commander. And then we deployed with him up to up to Southwest and, and uh, uh, Dungwa. And Terry and Chris went in Angola with them. And they run into the Berlin Battalion twice, in two nights running, took a major captive, ca captive and that's, a, that's their lead of SWAPO. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they killed a pass of them. Just a bunch of reservists. And so, you know, the training we did with them. You know, and it, it, they come back, and all of us, you know, the guy carrying the MAG and everybody, the rifleman. I, one thing I found in the SAA is nobody knew how to change magazines quickly. That can be done in a second. But they, they don't know. And uh, we train them. And, boy, they'd it's, say, it's yeah, things like this, that, you know, that we showed them. And Chris and Terry were with Captain Euster at the time. You know, they're, yeah, steady on guys, you know, in a firefight. Chris had the Bronze Cross of Rhodesia. I mean, he was no schlep, uh, solid man. And, um, you know, and it was, and they, they were very instrumental in me getting, becoming a soldier again and just kind of reintegrating out of that hospital. Yeah. And, um, uh, and they were very patient with me in the end. I mean, we argued and, you know, we're you know, pulling each other's piss constantly. But they, they were great guys, and I will never forget them. Mm. And uh, anyway, I, you know, we we spent our time in Angola. We eventually came back to, uh, you know, uh, Murray Hill, you know, and uh, I think we were about three or four months. But I worked with the Psy units. Anybody that need, needed things sorted out with machine gun, 3-2 battalion, yeah. I'd up in Angiva, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd sort the machine guns out. It was it was something I already had a knack for. And I had an absolute fascination with machine guns since I was a kid. Yeah, I loved them. You know, they were just the most incredible weapons. Yeah. You know, they did so much damage. You know, it was just fantastic. You know, and um, every kid's dream. Um, anyway, so I um, yeah, and and it was uh, you know, um, and my in December of 1982, my I hadn't had any leave. Didn't have any convalescent leave, nothing. I didn't want it. I wanted to get back in the army. I wanted to go and, and get back up and you know and operational. And I, I will also never forget the day Staff Sergeant Mavaba says we got to we got to go up inside and resupply, get on the machine gun bar. I thought that's the day I've arrived. Mm. You know, can, no more can you do this. Just get on the machine gun bar. And I climbed up in the Biffle, no problem, and and and, and did that. And um, in training, we were back in training again. You know, uh, now that was going into Angola. Um, and back in now we're back in, in Murray Hill, and I started driving a sawmill, you know, troops in the sawmill, you uh -huh. know, taking them here and there, you know, and um, uh, you know, just out the out to the you know the range, machine gun range, whatever we were going, and uh, you know, I, I had no problem. I just thought I could drive a truck again, and uh, you know, so I mean, I it's, I did it differently. It'd scare you watching me. It looked like a machine out of control doing stuff with my hands, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it worked and. Uh, yeah. Um, and you know, and my enlistment was coming to close, and uh, I, I, they were going to let me go a little bit earlier, and hadn't any leave in two years. Yeah. And uh, you know, so um, I uh, I separated, uh, and we had a wonderful uh, going away party. 
that, that, that at the parachute brigade, we had a wonderful going away party, and Sergeant Major McAleese was there, and, and Terry and Chris, and, and a lot of the parabats, and I guess it, it was a great comment. I don't guess nothing. They gave me a book of honoris crocs with her. It says, hey, we, we can't give you a decoration. You're a foreigner. You know that. But yeah. he says, this is what we can give you in respect to your service. And uh, I thought, well, what a great compliment. I still got that book, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, put away in my, you know, uh, in my things of memory, you know, and um, and uh, I separated and I went home with my mom and dad. Yeah, sure. Amazing. Yeah, because, you know, I, I walked in, oh, get control here. I walked in on four years till a dad left. They knew about the right leg. Mm. But I didn't have the heart to tell them about the left. You know, I'm so far away in Africa. What, what did they know? You know, they, they, you know. anyway, I, uh, I, you know, so, you know, we, after a, a very, very touching reunion, my, my folks were tough. You know, they grew up hard in the Depression. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, they really, and, and they were over, it was it. It was done. Hello, you're here. And, uh, you know, and very soon they, no more, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, they where everything was back, and my dad and I were out in the garage, uh, you know, pulling the motorcycle out of, out of mothballs and getting all the plastic off it. Yeah. Cosmoline. In a couple of days, my father was retired. We had it up on its wheels, modified the rear brake, yeah. and um, modified the rear brake so my foot would my right because of the mechanical knee, my foot was going to sit on that brake all the time. And I'd, I have overload springs, and I'd overload them and operate the rear brake. Yeah. And um, you know, so the idea was to push down on the stump, the push on the leg, the push on the brake to stop the motorcycle, and it works most of the time. Ask my passengers. And um, anyway, uh, then we had to put an electric starter on, so we took the Harley Davidson dealer. And um, um, I want to—I'm going to backtrack. And I was saying something. It's funny how God works in our lives. I ended up in the landmine and in the hospital. It was, and it was probably right around December, you know, 1981, you know, I'd been all chopped up. It was a pretty miserable time when one of my buddies came and said, hey, Alan Jingles was killed. Mm. He was planting a mine to blow up a train in Mozambique, and him and his number two were, boom, gone. Mm. And I'm sure if I'd have been, if I'd have been accepted in the reconnaissance, I would have been his number two. Yeah. 